Hello, I'm Robert Costa in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. We are following the latest developments out of Gaza. Take a look at these images. You can see strikes and flares now lighting up the sky on the northern Gaza Strip from Gaza City. This comes as Secretary of State Antony Blinken is traveling to the region for the second time in less than a month. Israel has not only the right but the obligation to defend itself and also to take steps to try to make sure that this never happens again. We've also said very clearly and repeatedly that how Israel does this matters. Nancy Cordes and Scott McFarland join us now. Nancy is CBS News' chief White House correspondent. Scott is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Thank you both for being here. Nancy, let's begin with you. What is the White House learning about the latest activity in Gaza, and what is the administration's response? Robert, the White House hasn't said anything yet about these flares, but that's not unusual. They typically try to take a backseat in these situations. They don't want to get ahead of any Israeli military operation or get in the way, frankly. You know, today in the White House briefing room, when a lot of reporters were asking about uh, the uh, strike on an, a Palestinian refugee camp, we had a lot of questions about it, uh, about the the people who were there, whether that strike could have been avoided, how many people were killed. And in most instances, White House officials simply referred us to the Israelis. They don't want to appear to be criticizing the Israelis, and they also don't want to get into a situation where they feel that they have to comment on every single military operation that's taking place right now, because often we learn the true details days after the incident takes place. Scott, this is such a fast-moving story. How could all of this activity in Gaza, the looming violence, affect the ongoing congressional discussions about aid for Israel? This congressional debate has had an urgency, according to the supporters of the Israel aid package, but there's really no urgency to how they've crafted it. As the evening began here in Washington, there was this U.S. House vote on this $14 billion-plus emergency aid package for Israel. But the way it was drawn up, Bob, with cuts to the IRS to offset the spending, that is necessarily a deliberative, sluggish way of getting the money out the door because the Senate's not going to go for it. The Senate might not even take up this bill because they view that to be a poison pill. So no matter the circumstances on the ground in the Middle East, the House has set about a process to approve aid in a way that's going to take time. It's going to cost money. It's also going to cost time. Let's listen to what Vice President Kamala Harris had to say today about the administration in Israel. We are not telling Israel how it should conduct this war, and so I'm not going to speak to that. Nancy, the Vice President is over in the United Kingdom traveling abroad. When the administration articulates its policy now, it uses the phrase humanitarian pause. What is the origin of that in terms of the policy discussion inside of the administration? And what makes that different from a so-called ceasefire? So the president last night uh, started talking, Robert, about humanitarian pauses. Uh, in other words, brief, uh, brief stoppages of the fighting at strategic times if there's an opportunity to get civilians out of harm's way or to get hostages out of the country. So uh, they're not just talking about one particular humanitarian pause. They're talking about the possibility for strategic pauses from time to time when it uh, when there's an opening to get hostages out. The president actually argued at a fundraiser last night in Minnesota that he had been behind uh, a humanitarian pause a couple of weeks ago when both sides stopped fighting and two hostages, two Americans, a mother and her daughter from Illinois, were able to be uh, taken out of Gaza. So that's what they're talking about. Today, again, White House officials said that they oppose a broader ceasefire. That's, a, uh, in their view, a, a lengthier proposition uh, where both sides say that they're going to be halting the fighting for some indefinite period of time. They continue to argue, Robert, that... That is something that would benefit Hamas. It would give it time to regroup. And uh, even though we now are hearing from our first Democratic senator, uh, that's Dick Durbin of Illinois, that he thinks a, uh, a ceasefire would be a good idea, by and large, most of Congress still appears to agree with the White House that a ceasefire would not be called for at this time. Nancy, I would like to, uh, before we get to Scott again, just play something today 
Your exchange with Admiral Kirby pushing for more answers on this front. The president keeps saying Israel needs to follow international law. Israel needs to follow international law. That suggests that he thinks that Israel isn't following international law, doesn't it? No. Why would he be saying that if he felt that Israel was doing everything it needs to do to prevent civilian casualties? We've been saying it since the very beginning, Nancy, that, that uh, we want to see our good friend and partner abide by our shared commitments to the respect for civilian life and the respect for, for, uh, for the law of war. We've been saying that since, uh, since dang near the beginning of it. Nancy, any quick reaction? Sure. I mean, it's notable that the president keeps using that phrase. It's about as far as the White House is willing to go in criticizing its strong ally, Israel. They won't say point blank that they think that Israel isn't taking enough care to avoid civilian casualties, but they keep stressing that it needs to do more. In fact, Secretary of State Antony Blinken on the tarmac before he left for Israel, what did he say he was going there to do? To see if there are ways to better protect Palestinian civilians. The White House is under a lot of pressure on this front, Bob. Speaking about somebody under a lot of pressure, Scott, you have been carefully tracking a certain senator from the ruby red deep south as he continues to push for a military freeze in terms of nominations. How is the reaction among Republicans going up on Capitol Hill? By the collegial standards of the U.S. Senate, it has been a particularly cutting, aggressive amount of criticism, including on the floor against Tommy Tuberville of Alabama, for this hold he's put on place on nearly 400 military confirmations. His Republican colleagues now accusing him of jeopardizing the military. We brought that question to Senator Tuberville a short while ago. Take a listen. Senator, it's, it's your Republican colleagues who say you're weakening the military. Really? Well, are, are you at, opinion, are are you at risk of weakening the military? No. no. As I've told you all along, if I thought there was any problem with readiness, we wouldn't be doing this. Those were some uh, biting has, criticisms you got last night. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a little character assassination at times. But. Three military confirmations approved today, Bob, including the first ever woman on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But Senator Tuberville is doubling down, saying he's keeping going with this hold as long as the abortion policy DOD has in effect stays in effect. Nancy Cordes and Scott McFarlane on the beat reporting as ever. Thank you so much for being with us. Meanwhile, on the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump now pledging a sweeping immigration crackdown if he wins the White House again. Among his promises, mass deportations, ending birthright citizenship, and denying entry to legal immigrants based on their ideological beliefs. CBS News immigration reporter Camilo Montoya Galvez, who is following the former president in Houston, joins us now. Thank you for being here. You've written an extensive report for CBS News about what could loom on the horizon for 2025. Who in the president, former president's inner circle, Camilo, is pushing this? And where does this actually go in terms of a legislative agenda? Hi, Bob. Good afternoon. Former President Donald Trump certainly believes that this is a galvanizing issue for his voters. He is hoping to use this issue again to potentially win back the White House and to return there in 2025. In fact, he has promised to oversee a complete overhaul in U.S. immigration and border policy if he is elected in 2024. The president, the former president, that is, has promised mass deportations, the largest deportation operation in U.S. history, more specifically. And he has promised to do that by invoking a law from 1798 to deport gang members and by enlisting the National Guard, Bob, to arrest migrants. He has also promised to enact new screenings for legal immigrants to deny entry to those who have certain political beliefs, such as Marxists, as the president, the former president would call them. And he has promised to deny U.S. citizenship to the children of undocumented immigrants, those who are living here in the country unlawfully. His rhetoric on immigration, Bob, has also escalated and intensified. He recently said that some migrants here are poisoning the blood of the country. And so, the president, the former president, believes that this is certainly a winning issue for him. But I do have to underscore, Bob, that many of these proposals, such as ending birthright citizenship through executive action, will certainly face formidable legal and operational challenges. That's certainly going to be the case. Uh, the courts will be looking at all of this if it ever happens. Camilo Montoya Galvez, thank you so much for That's being right. here and for your reporting. 
It's been almost three years since January 6th, yet it still looms over the Republican Party. Next, former Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger discusses how that day could affect a second Trump presidency. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Between former President Trump's dominance in the polls and the election of Mike Johnson to the speakership, we're starting to get a clearer picture of the direction for the GOP in the coming year. My colleague Scott McFarland sat down with former Republican Congressman of Illinois, Adam Kinzinger, to discuss just that. We're joined by Adam Kinzinger, former congressman from Illinois, author of the new book, Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country. So why'd you write the book? Well, look, you know, I, it's, it's funny when people said you're writing a book about yourself feels like inherently arrogant. They're right, it does. But I realized that my story actually tells the broader story, which is like what's happened to the GOP, some of the challenges in there, bigger challenges of the country. And so I just want people to be able to look back and say, like, you know, look, a lot of us didn't see some of this coming. We saw some parts of this, you know, coming, but we're in real trouble and we need some help. And here's how we got there. So I think that's a really the big motivation behind writing it, because I just think, you know, particularly the Republican Party is a very is in a very unhealthy place at the moment. What happens if Donald Trump becomes president again in January 2025? Well, look, I think it's really dangerous. I think, you know, January 6th was like, if you think of a guardrail, interstate, you know, the, the car hit the guardrail and we survived. The guardrails of democracy held up. The problem is the weaknesses are there now and people know where they are. And so just like the guardrails on an interstate can take a hit, they can't take a second hit. And I think if that car hits that again, if Donald Trump is reelected, he's not going to put people around him that are, you know, willing to tell him no or willing to say, like, no, sir, you know, my commitment is to the Constitution. He'll be able to find people that will be willing to say yeah, I'll, I'll do anything you want. I mean, you just have to interview probably 20 candidates for attorney general, sadly, to find one willing to say, yeah, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, including drop the charges against you. So I, I think it's a really dangerous moment, and it's one that we can't take too lightly. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's a real possibility he could win. You think he pardons all the January 6th defendants? You think he gets rid of his own cases? What, what else do you think happens in those opening days? Well, I think he first off just puts complete, utter uh, sycophants to him around the Oval Office and around the White House. And what that means is you get not well-qualified people, of course, and, and people that just want to respond to his whims. He gets no pushback. I think he does end up kind of mass pardoning the January 6th defendants. He's basically said as much. Um, and if his, if, case, if his cases are still pending... Um, he could either pardon himself, maybe if he's already been convicted in theory, or he can just simply direct the Department of Justice to drop the cases against him, and DOJ will do that. I mean, you know, we've, we've taken for granted the impartiality of the Department of Justice because for the most part we've had people unwilling to, vite, to fight that, to violate it. That's not Donald Trump, though. It's a new House speaker now. Um, Trump seemed to have his fingerprints a little bit on that election and who couldn't win that election when Tom Emmer pulled out, Tom Emmer who voted to certify the election in 2020. Um, what do you think about the new speaker and how he got to that spot? Well, first off, I want to just point out the split screen between Jenna Ellis, I think almost that same day, reading in front of the nation a confession that she lied about the election being stolen. And she was like the fourth person to take a plea saying, yes, they misled the American people in this Georgia issue. And converse that with, you know, now if you wanted to run for Speaker of the House, you had to be an election denier. That was like the cost of entry. It goes to show how out of touch, frankly, uh, the Republican Party is right now in D.C., and it goes to show how they just don't care about truth. Mike Johnson, look, he's a, he's a blank slate, so people kind of say he presents well. The only interaction I ever really had with him was him asking me to join a lawsuit that he was leading to help throw out the, ele the election results in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. You know, he he's, he's a, claims to be a man of faith, and I guess I don't doubt that, except I'm sure he's smart enough to know the election wasn't stolen, so why continue to lie about it? For what? Um, look, I wish him luck, because if he succeeds, the country succeeds. But uh, I'm, I'm disappointed in what the Republican Party has done. 
And I was impressed that they had kept my, uh, Jim Jordan out of there, but they unfortunately didn't have the strength to do it twice. I want to unpack that answer. I think there's something important in there, in particular. You think Mike Johnson and any number of other Republicans in the House with you knew the election wasn't stolen, just knew sure. it, and were doing this cravenly. I mean, it's 100% true. Look, I, I think there's a few now, particularly in the new class, that you know ran as kind of stop the steal folks, maybe that truly believe it. But it's very few, very few. The vast majority of them know the truth, but they choose to lie. And I don't know. I, I, I mean, for me, I haven't been able to get into why they can do it, except that there's a belief. And I think Jim Jordan's one of these, and, and, and maybe Mr. Johnson is too. I don't know. Uh, but that truly believes the left is so evil, their words, that is so evil that in any way to beat them, you have to beat them, no matter what it takes, even if it's lying, even if it's stealing. That's a very frightening thing, and democracy does not survive under those conditions. And that's why I think, frankly, in 2024, the only thing on the ballot is not names, it's not issues, it's do you support democracy or don't you support democracy, because I think it's that important of a moment. Author of the new book, Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country, Adam Kinzinger, served in the U.S. House from Illinois. Thanks for the time. You bet. As the 2024 Republican field rapidly shifts, some candidates are looking ahead to next week's debate. Coming up, we'll discuss the race with a former campaign manager and a spokesperson for a former vice president. You're streaming America Decides. Now, I'm leaving this campaign, but let me promise you, I will never leave the fight for conservative values, and I will never stop fighting to elect principled Republican leaders to every office in the land. Welcome back to America Decides. Former Vice President Mike Pence has dropped out of the 2024 presidential race, suspending his campaign, but says he will continue to push for strong Republican leaders nationwide. Joining me now on set here at CBS is Devin O'Malley and Rob Burgess. Devin is a spokesperson for former Vice President Pence and the managing director of Narrative Strategies. Rob is the former campaign manager for Aza Hutchison and a chief strategist at Connector Labs. Great to have you both here. Really appreciate you coming by. There are those who are pundits and there are those who are in the arena. And you are two who have been in the arena throughout the 2024 cycle. You see it from the inside. At this crossroads for the Republican race, Devin, we'll start with you. Where does the conservative vote go from here, the conservative movement, now that your uh, longtime boss and, and confidant, former Vice President Pence, is suspending? Where does that wing start to move in the coming weeks? Yeah, well, I think what you've seen in, in the last week or so in the polling is that uh, the race is tightening. Unfortunately, it's not the race uh, for first place. It's the race for second place. And uh, I think the inevitability of, of Donald Trump uh, is, uh, is growing. Uh, and uh, the candidates that remain... Uh, need to make the case to voters as to why they're the best alternative uh, to Donald Trump. And I, and I think at least several of them are, are, are kind of missing the mark there. Uh, and, and so we'll see how this plays out as uh, scrutiny and the attention uh, that Iowa gets increases over the coming months. And when you look at uh, former Governor Hutchison, he's in the race still mm -hmm. running, even though you're not a decide anymore. But he's part of the anti-Trump vote in the Republican field. Is that anti-Trump vote going to consolidate in any way around someone like former Governor Christie or another contender? Right now, I think that's a hard thing to sort of look in the glass ball and, and decide, right? Voters don't seem to have an appetite to really coalesce behind one anti-Trump vote. Uh, but what I think we do need to see is more candidates do what Vice President Pence did and make a decision that's not only best for them, but best for the party as a whole and say, listen, right now might not be my time. Uh, but we need to get behind uh, fighting and supporting conservative principles, Republican principles, and find a candidate that can carry that standard for us. CBS has been reporting on former President Trump's immigration position, how he's going to call for mass deportation should he win the presidency again. Does that affect the race in any way, Devin? I, I think that there is a, a large cadre of voters out there that are skeptical of the promises that the president has uh, is making on immigration. Uh -huh. This is a a person whose entire 2016 campaign was centered around uh, finishing the wall, building the wall, and he never did it. Uh, and at the same time that he makes these immigration promises now, um, he's promising to run as essentially, a, you know, a liberal. He's promising essentially a 10% tax in the form 
uh, of tariffs. Uh, he's essentially abandoned any pro-life position that he, he once had over the last six or seven years. And so this is a, this is a person who uh, has wildly um, shifted his, his worldview and his policy positions, um, and he's failed to keep promises in the past. So I'm not sure why Republican voters uh, would take his word for it this time. So that's a point some people might bring up on a debate stage if Trump did show up for the debates, but the former president will not next week in Miami. So what are you watching in Miami when they're all on the stage except Trump? I'm really looking for a candidate to put forward an idea that is really grasping conservative values and conservative like voters what? at their heartstrings. They need to be talking about the economy first and foremost. You know, we aren't hearing a lot of the uh, boutique issues that the media likes to talk about on the campaign trail. We're not hearing about January 6th. We're hearing about the economy. We're hearing about paycheck issues and how the Biden uh, Inflation Reduction Act has actually caused more harm than good. Uh, and so by reowning that that trust of the American voter and showing that we can win on economic issues, not just national security issues, that's going to be very important in this election. And whatever candidate can stand up and have that strong, unique idea is really going to sort of propel themselves into second place. Speaking about the economy and spending, how do you believe Speaker Johnson and the Republican position on spending on Ukraine, on spending on Israel, how that's going to in any way bleed into the presidential debate? I think the the Candidates' positions on Ukraine aid and, and aid to Israel are, are pretty well baked. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it has that much of an effect. Uh, there's there's not a lot, I think, that's that's bleeding over into the presidential campaign. Uh, I mean, in the sense that there aren't uh, externalities that are really moving the race in, in any way. I think there there were people uh, in the or outside and pundits that were saying that uh, what's going on in the Middle East right now is going to change the dynamics of the race. Um, it was certainly talked about in the context of, of Vice President Pence and, and his expertise in foreign policy. Um, and we just saw very early on that that was just not the case. It's not happening. We only have a couple of minutes left here. So quickly, inside your world, your top strategist inside the Republican Party, is DeSantis done, the Florida governor? I don't think he's done yet. I think there's still time, especially when you're looking at Iowa, right? Iowans are really going to put the, the determination on what candidates are viable for the caucus when the stove starts to stick to the ground. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, coming up here in the next few weeks. A lot of time left, but he's got to run a, a pretty flawless campaign from here on out. The Nikki Haley donor chatter for real or somewhat of a fantasy? Uh, I, at this point, I think it remains to be seen. I, I think that they're foregoing Iowa for later states. And I'm, I'm not sure that uh, it's the best strategy when, you know, the, the former governor of South Carolina is not polling very high in South Carolina. I think it it causes some real uh, challenges uh, in, in, in the days and weeks ahead after South Carolina. Haley gaining or not? Let's look at Iowa. Let's look at New Hampshire. These campaigns, you need to win the first two states before you can start looking five, six states down the road. Solidify that momentum, either DeSantis or Nikki. Get in a strong second place in Iowa, and we'll see how it carries you. Do voters care when you're out there, when you're talking to them, listening to your candidates, uh, former candidates, about Trump's legal challenges? Yes or no? No. Really? No, not, not at all. Not at all. It's not, not brought up at all. Devin O'Malley and Rob Burgess, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. And that does it for today. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.